Well, it's just 2 o'clock, so I figure we might as well go ahead and get started. We've got a good good number of people on, online. I want to welcome you to, this is Alex and Weir with the National Diaphragm Network. I'd like to welcome you to our, our webinar today on shipping and warehousing, the logistics of growing a, a cyber bank. And we're very pleased to have our own Chris Blake, uh, the CEO of First Candle and a board member of National Diaphragm Network, and our brains behind logistics uh, here at NDBN. Uh, Start this, uh, provide this presentation on shipping, warehousing, and basically how what you need to know to, to be able to find the warehouse of your dreams. So without further ado, Chris, I'd like to turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. I think that um, having a, a warehouse, I know when I first got started getting product donations and moving lots of product from corporate donors to local charities, I, I felt like I was a bit over my head, and I didn't really have anybody to uh, to talk to me or to guide me through some of these things that we're going to talk about today. So I was trying to remember back uh, all those years ago when I first got started and all the mistakes I made and um, all the things that um, went well and some of the things that didn't go well. So hopefully as we're going uh, through this today, um, I'll be able to catch everything that I uh, that I experienced those years ago. But I, I did want to also mention, Allison, I, I think that you're going to be moderating this as well, but if you have questions, please feel free to um, talk to me while I'm speaking. Don't wait until the end. It would help me a lot to, um, you know, to make sure that I'm capturing the dialogue and make sure that I'm answering questions so I'm in no rush. And, and really the purpose of this is to, is to answer those kinds of questions that, that you're dealing with, not just to talk about my experiences. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to, to jump in and, and ask. And like I said, I believe Allison's going to be moderating that. Right. And if you uh, feel a little of, shy, you can always type um, the question in the chat box uh, underneath the presenters. All right. So most I was just going to say that the most important thing about what a good warehouse does, the most important thing is that it adds value. If you're not in a place where a warehouse will add value, then don't don't get one. If you're if you have a warehouse that's taking away from what you're doing, then it's the wrong warehouse. A good warehouse always adds value, um, not just to the amount of product, which seems you know obvious because you're able to store more product, but also in accessibility, um, the ability for people to to get uh, merchandise, diapers, and other items that that are needed. Um, the variety of product that you can offer. The more warehouse space that you have, the more variety of uh, kinds of products, sizes of products, and things like that, and in the number of people that you that you serve. So those are the kinds of things that you want to look for in the value um, proposition that a good warehouse is going to bring to your organization. And the function of a warehouse is, I mean, basically, again, this is total warehousing 101. Probably everybody knows this, but just to say that the function of a, a warehouse is you want a place to consolidate all the transportation all the product coming in and product going out. You want to be able to mix the product, um, the service that you can provide, and uh, also that it um, protects the merchandise that you've got. Uh, both we'll talk about from the, the, the weather standpoint, but also from a security standpoint. Um, the fact that you, if you're able to provide customer service through your warehouse and the other function of the warehouse is that it's going to minimize your effort, minimize the amount of work that you do, and thereby minimize your costs. So the, the slide that's up now is what to look for in a warehouse, and that's where we're going to get, get started. When I first got started looking at warehouses, the only thing that I was considering initially was how much it cost. I just wanted to get something for free. Um, and then the first warehouse I got was for free, and it was such a mess, it ended up costing me more than had I paid for a, a warehouse. So I wanted to make sure that we talked about that first, and that a lot of times price is a constraining factor, especially for charities, and it's easily the first thing that we look at, but it definitely shouldn't be the only thing. Um, price can uh, can be a driving factor in the kind of warehouse you're looking for and where you're looking for a warehouse, but there's other things to consider too. So I want to take a couple minutes and go through, I think I pulled 10 of these, um, but maybe there's more we should add at the end. So um, we'll pause partway through and see if we need to add anything. 
But size is clearly important, not just for the amount of product that you're moving now, but if you're going to normally get into a warehouse, you have to get into some sort of a leasing arrangement. Um, so knowing how much space you need now and your growth for the coming year is an important um, factor in determining if it's a good warehouse for you, what you should be looking for, um, how many um, trucks that you're moving in and out, the storage, the amount of time that it stays there, all those things will influence the amount of um, size of the warehouse that you need. Chris, do you have Number a two, what sort of a warehouse, what size warehouse you should start with? Well, I mean, that's different. I mean, it's different for everybody. Like one of the things that I ran into when I first started is that, you know, I had gotten a uh, donation of uh, books that I'd wanted to use and I'd gotten a warehouse just for that. And then I was out asking for other stuff too. And then I got three truckloads of, of toys donated, stuffed animals. And then immediately the warehouse, the first warehouse that I had was no good. I had to go out and get a second warehouse. So the size of the warehouse depends not just on the product that you have coming in now, but most of us are out asking for product donation. Um, so we should think about what happens if we get those things that we're asking for. So I don't know if there would be a, um, I don't know if there would be a uh, hard and fast answer to that. I think it depends a lot of, like I said, what we have now and, and what we're asking for. I don't know. Does anybody else have any insight into that? I don't. My question is very similar. How do you take your growth projections and use that to determine your warehousing space needs? I'm sorry. Can you speak up? I, we can't quite hear you. Oh, my, my question was along similar lines, actually. It was, um, how do you take your growth projections and use that to determine your warehousing space needs? Um, what about the question of, of uh, I mean, if, if uh, um, you're expecting a truckload of diapers, that's about 350,000 diapers or so. How much space would you need for that? Is that one way of, of maybe guessing? Well, uh the, the pallets that come and the truckloads that come it might be an easier way to look at it. But I, I do want to uh, – that, that's Sorry. an important question. But when we start talking about number two, you'll see that it's more than just the storage space because there's other things to consider. But um, normally on a truckload, if you're getting a truckload of, of diapers delivered, and, and that's a 53-foot truck, so that's a large semi-truckload, that normally holds um, – 26 pallets, and a pallet is four by four. So, I mean, I've used a storage space that was just a container that you can rent that just, you know, they dropped it in the parking lot of the, of the place where I was working, and I was able to use that for storage. It was very small, but I didn't have a lot of, a lot of um, needs as far as the space initially, and I was able to grow it. So, uh, another time at another organization I worked at, I went into and rented a, a warehouse space with the opportunity to you – know, I was just a partial renter of the space, and I was able to increase the space as was needed. So there's a lot of different options for that, for your growth projections. I think that if you, you have some history getting product in, you'll have a better idea of the amount of space that you need. But if not, um, I would suggest getting into something that you can easily um, add to. But then that takes us to number two, which is the – I'm sorry, someone else speaking? Okay, so that takes us to number two then, which is the layout. Um, because in addition for the space for the storage, um, you need space for volunteers to work. Um, some organizations don't have any volunteers. Some have a lot, and so uh, having a space for those volunteers is also going to be a part of what you're looking for in your in your warehouse. Some people have um, offices that they need in their warehouse. I don't think I ever had an office. But then there were other people that I've worked with who wouldn't consider having a warehouse space without offices in it. And then there are so many other things that you can, you know, feel like you, you need in your warehouse space apart from those things. But the layout is important, and there's a lot of, you know, every organization is different, and the additional space they need beside the storage is important, so I would encourage you to make sure that you've got a place for, if you're using volunteers, and a lot of volunteers, that you've got uh, space for them to come in and, and move around if you need offices and things like that. We can move on to the next slide. Okay. So 
So the other thing that you want to look for, and we'll talk about more about this in a minute, is the, is the flow. There are lots of movement that happens in the warehouse. And are the aisles wide? Is, is the aisles wide and is there space for the move room? Um, if you're using forklifts and pallet jacks and things like that, again, in addition to the straight forward space you need, you know how big a semi truck is, it's 53 feet long, but then in addition to that, you have to have aisles, you have to be able to move stuff around. Um, and the cubic capacity. When I originally started working in warehouses, I just thought I was buying for the amount of floor space. I just was always asking about square footage. But what I came to learn is that in warehouse space, it's more about cubic capacity than it is um, the square footage of the, of the floor space. Because all that space going up high, you're paying for that space, too. Um, Could I chime in, Chris? This is Mike Cradle to Crowns in Philadelphia. And just wanted to say one of the things about the aisles that you also have to factor in is that the fire marshal may have specific requirements for the width of the aisles. Excellent. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, there's so many different kinds of warehouses and kinds of things that you um, can look at as far as purchasing or renting. Normally, if you're renting space, they should know that. I know that that's a requirement in New York, um, and we always have sufficient space. I'm not sure, though, if that's um, the same across, um, you know, with, with with every state, with every location, or if it's unique to to um, you know to the different to the different areas and states, but uh, that's definitely something to consider. Yeah, I think generally. Does anybody uh, fire, else have any insight on this? Fire restrictions generally are um, local to the um, the municipality, so you want to check with your local fire um, fire department and fire marshal to see what restrictions there are. So that's good to know. Um, but again, if you're renting space from a uh, from a place that um, you know from a from a larger warehouse, that should be something that's already taken into consideration. Right. Um, uh, so anyway, cubic capacity. Make sure that you look up. Those warehouses are tall for a reason. They should be tall for a reason. I remember one space I got into. I ended up getting some. There's special shelving that they have for um, for warehouses. It's very heavy duty and can handle all the weight. And I was able to cut my, I was renting the space at this warehouse at, at the time and got some shelving donated and was able to cut the space that I was renting to about a third and had more room um, just because I was able to put that shelving in and um, was able to get product stacked going all the way to the ceiling. So one of the things to make sure you look for in a warehouse is how high you can go and if, uh, if you're able to get those shelves. Uh, the fifth thing I said to look for in a warehouse is um, equipment. Uh, ideally, you'll be moving a lot of product in and out of the warehouse. You're going to need to move that. Normally, you can't do it by hand. You're going to have to have uh, very specific equipment, the right kind of equipment. And we're going to talk about that more in detail. But some warehouses provide the equipment. Some warehouses um, won't let you use the, their equipment, some will only let you use their equipment. They won't let you, uh, they won't, they won't do any of the work themselves. So be very, um, make sure that when you walk into it, you're, you make sure that you have the equipment and the manpower to drive it. Um, and, and, so, and if they don't have the equipment, they won't allow you to use the equipment. Is it possible to bring your own equipment in? And like I said, in a minute, we're going to talk about the, the different kinds of equipment to look for, but, but that's definitely something that you need to take into consideration when you're looking for a specific work. Okay, number six. The staging area is uh, the area where product comes off of the truck initially. And when a truck pulls up and, and the product is getting unloaded with the forklift or with the pallet jack, um, it has to be... Um, put somewhere, and normally it doesn't go immediately up on the shelf, it goes into this wide open area near the docks, that it can be staged. And when it's staged there, it's set aside for all the product coming off the truck because you normally want to put it up in a specific order and um, checking it for damage and things like that. So you want to make sure that the, there is a staging area in the, in the warehouse so that when the merchandise comes off the trucks, it's able to be um, dropped off somewhere where it can be uh, you know, gone through carefully. Uh, which takes us to number seven, is truck access and the loading dock. 
uh, can a large 53-foot tra trailer truck easily get to the warehouse entrance? You'll be surprised how many warehouses are built without that consideration, um, and, and that makes it very difficult. Um, I mean, even to the extent where one of the warehouses that I used was an active parking lot, which had enough space when I looked at it on the weekend, but then when trucks were coming in and out during the week, there were always cars that were in the way. You had to go search in neighboring warehouses and neighboring offices to people to come move these cars. So the, the idea that there's a truck access and trucks can get in and out again might seem like something that should be taken for granted, but don't ever take that for granted because it's important to, uh, I mean, really the key of it is getting that product on and off the, the truck. A lot of people have questions about number eight, about what a loading dock is. There's a lot of different kinds of loading docks. Um, but every warehouse must have a, a loading dock, especially if you're going to move a lot of products in and out. You can have a storage area that doesn't have a loading dock, but a, a warehouse will definitely have something built into it to allow the, the product to be moved on and off the truck. This loading dock can be just a raised platform so that when the truck comes in and, and backs up to your warehouse that the platform is raised and the merchandise comes off the truck and right onto the warehouse floor. Um, sometimes there's a ramp that they can bring um, and connect to the to the truck so that the forklift or can go up into the truck and then bring stuff down to the ground level. So uh, there's different kinds of docks, but every warehouse, like I said, if you're going to move a lot of product, uh, you're going to be very unhappy with your storage area if you don't have a loading dock. Any thoughts on this page? We're ready to move on. What would be um? What, is there any sort of workaround if you have a what looks like a warehouse but there's not a pure loading dock? Can you can you cre create your own ramp for the truck or is um, that something? Yes. No, that's that. Uh, there's a lot of warehouse space that is um, built on the floor, but they you know on the ground level, but they do have a a ramp, um, a metal ramp, very heavy duty ramp that can be rolled up or pushed to the back of the truck so that a forklift can go up and down. So yeah, absolutely they can they can do that. And that's that's the same as a as a loading dock. I mean it's a ramp but it's kind of as, as a dock. Um, it just makes everything easier to have something that connects the the floor of the warehouse to the floor of the truck. And if you don't have that then it just increases your work. And again, like I said, one of the purposes of having a warehouse is to minimize the effort. So yeah, that's very, very important. There are workarounds to it, but um, but the idea of the dock, whether it's a ramp or, or a raised dock, is uh, is critical. Thanks. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about uh, lift gates and trucks like that, but I just want to focus on what we should be looking for in a warehouse. Anybody else? Okay, so then um, the last two things. Number nine is location. Is it close to a freeway? Um, sometimes uh, they'll, people will try to give you really great prices for warehouses or residential neighborhoods, but then once you get into that warehouse, you find out that our trucks are not allowed in those residential neighborhoods, or it's too far away from the freeway. It's difficult for the trucks to get in. Um, so road restrictions and freeways are very important. That location is critical. Is it in a safe neighborhood, especially if you have Volunteers, are they going to feel safe? Is it going to be a part of town that they're going to want to be in? A lot of times, warehouses are in less than ideal situations. Um, and so you want to make sure that it's safe and convenient. So location is important. Um, and also, number 10, the general condition of it. Is it dry? Um, and is it secure? One time I got a free warehouse space at Kennedy Airport. I was very excited about that and very happy. And we got a large donation of uh, toys around the um, uh, around um, the NBC toy drive. We were able to deliver toys all throughout New York City, but we had so many toys coming in at one time, we didn't have the money. But we got this uh, donated space at um, Kennedy Airport. And when we got there and unloaded the truck, it was nothing but a roof. There were no walls, and it was in the middle of the biggest snowstorm that, that early or that late part of the year. And it was just a disaster because even though it was free and it was poorly and all the good cause, it certainly was not dry and secure. And the only heat I had was uh, 
was my uh, coffee. So, so good. Anything else to look at for a warehouse? Anything we might have missed? What about so those are the 10 things to, yes. Any thoughts on how to find warehouse space? Um, well, I, I think for me, I was always um, looking at, looking at uh, places ar around in those neighborhoods where there were warehouses at. I know that we would look in, um, I mean, we would Google it sometimes. I mean, I've used so many different kinds of warehouses. And there's lots of stuff. We've used real estate agents to help us find uh, commercial warehouse space. So I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, people that you might know um, would be the place where I would start. And I would exhaust every other idea before I went to a real estate agent. But, um, but I think it's like looking for an apartment, looking for any other sort of real estate. The usual suspects normally, normally apply. OK, great, thanks. <laughs> Good. Next slide. Oh, so we were talking about equipment a minute ago, and there's the pictures of the main kinds of equipment that you need. The forklift is mainly used to get product off the truck. Um, it's a it's machinery. It's motorized. You have to have a, a license to drive one. Although, who knows? I've driven them enough without a license, so. You should always have a license or at least someone that's been trained to drive them and to operate them. It can be very dangerous, and so you definitely want someone that, that you trust to drive them. But a forklift is very important if you're unloading large amounts of product off of a truck. Even if you have a, a loading dock situation, a forklift will make your uh, job so much easier, and that's what a forklift is. As opposed to a pallet jack, which does somewhat of the same job as a forklift, a pallet jack, um, picks up those pallets and, and then you move them manually. Um, obviously a, a pallet jack can't put product, put pallets up on a high shelf or, or get stuff off the truck, but it can be used to move items around the warehouse that are still in pallet form. The warehouse cart is if you're going around uh, picking items and uh, have someone coming in just picking stuff up and just picking items and then use the warehouse cart to uh, get those small amount of items to them. And of course, I put down at the bottom the workbenches, the tables, and the chairs um, that are needed for the volunteers. But those are pictures that a lot of people ask um, for a detailed explanation of what those items are, but that's basically that. Okay. What would you say is the most useful um, equipment that if you were if trying to, to, to focus all your efforts on what? One just would mostly focus on getting the the, uh, the forklift or the pallet jack. You could get by with a pallet jack, but you better have someone strong to be slinging those pallets around. But you can you can unload a truck with a pallet jack. A forklift can be harder to get sometimes because it's more expensive and because it's you know requires uh, someone trained to drive it. It can be more difficult to obtain, but there's nothing that will make your life easier on a warehouse than a forklift. Um, so I would say the most important one is pallet jack only because anybody can use it and it's a lot easier to uh, to um, operate. But the forklift is the one that, that will make your life terrible. Hey, Chris. Uh, it's Emilio here in Texas. Hi, uh, Hey, uh, your suggestion on uh, on power lifts, um, you know, we use them here. I don't know if, uh, if anybody else has any clue about what those are. Oh, you know, that's that's great. I was in one warehouse once where they used it, but I've never used power lifts. Um, power lift is basically a combination between a kind of a combination between a pallet jack and a forklift. It's motorized. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? I didn't include a picture only because I've never used it, but it, it's interesting. Yeah, well, uh, like you said there, they're, they're a combination of a, like a pallet jack and a forklift. Uh, they run on battery power uh, that you can actually plug in straight to the wall depending on the time that you get. They run about you know around that four to five thousand dollar range um, for you know a decent one that will that'll lift and pull out the pallets. It works really quick. Um, you know it, anybody can use it. You don't have to be tri you don't have to be licensed to use it. You can just easily you know just somebody just really can show you how to use it. It's the same way as if you're using a pallet jack. It's just really um, you know it's motorized. 
Uh, so it'll lift it up. It'll move quicker. Um, you can even get them that where they will lift up the same way as a forklift and lift them up, you know, up to uh, 36, 48 inches off the ground. Uh, so that way you can put them onto your, uh, your shelving as you may. Uh, in fact, if any of y'all have contacts with like grocers and grocery stores, go ahead and ask to go in the back. Every grocery store has those because they keep high rise racks in the back and they'll show you what those are. Um, so they're pretty, they're pretty great to use. Uh, so they're very easy. And like when I, when I was working for uh, a grocer here in Texas, you know, I was 16 years old wrangling them around the warehouse. So, um, they, um, they work really well. And, um, I said they're, they're a moderate investment, you know, five, six thousand dollars for a, on the cheap end, but they will, um, they'll save you a lot of time. Yeah, that's, that's, like I said, that's great insight. I never used one. Um, but you know, it's, if Allison, I can go back and change this, uh, the deck right before it saves. Sure. So then what I'll do is I'll add a picture of that in and, uh, and put that right in between the forklift and the pallet deck picture so that when people are referring to this later, they can see it. But yeah, that's great insight. Good. Any other um, equipment that people have used in warehouses that isn't mentioned here that we should talk about? Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. So then uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, as we're managing the warehouse, I want to talk about our supply chain, the importance of safety, security, staff volunteers, documents, and insurance. Supply chain is the, is the term used to describe the, the, the product when it comes from the donor, of every step of the way, how it gets from the donor, uh, the corporate donor, through in this case, National Bank Bank Network, through your organization, through your warehouse, um, how you manage the, the the volunteers that are sorting it, how you determine who's going to receive the product, and ultimately how it gets distributed to the individual families. So that supply chain, the whole concept of it is, is important, and make sure that you know that once it becomes yours, that you have a good a good handle on your part of the supply chain. Uh, the, the most important thing clearly is safety. There's a lot of accidents that can happen and warehouses can be crazy places of things falling and machinery and vehicles and trucks. So make sure that you're always promoting safety. Security is important too. If you're sharing warehouse space, stuff's going to get stolen and it's just going to get missing. Um, so if you can't lock it up, if you can't call the whole thing yours, make sure that you don't store anything in there that you're going to mount walking because um, security is an important part of, of managing a warehouse. And if you're sharing a space, you know, the only thing you have in there is diapers, you know that not that many diapers are going to be stolen or taken. It might not be something that you worry about, but if you have other kinds of products, um, definitely you should be aware of it um, and to make sure that you're... Um, Warehouse is, is secure. The staff and the volunteers that are needed, the documents, we'll talk a little bit about the different kinds of documents. The most important one is the bill of lading or the bill of loading. Um, but the bill of lading is the document that basically is the piece of paper that connects you to the warehouse where the product came from. You want to make sure that you always collect that piece of paper. It's against the law for a trucker to have product in his truck without a bill of lading if he's doing stuff. Um, interstate, but um, but they should always have a bill of lading that you should get a copy of with the amount of product and with the amount of um, the, the kind of product that's on the bill of lading needs to match your, um, your uh, you know, what you receive and also documents going out. You want to make sure that those are very individualized as far as the accounting for the product that goes out and where it goes. So maybe in a minute we can take some time to talk about what different people do for those documents. And then the insurance, insurance is going to be different for everyone depending on how much merchandise you have in your warehouse, how many volunteers are coming through, um, things like that. But you have to have insurance. You move on to the next slide. Sure. So there should be, as you, after you get your warehouse space, after you 
figured out volunteers, after you've figured out your insurance, you definitely want to have a working warehouse. And I wanted to talk for a minute about the, the design, the layout of, of what it is. Um, it's always important to use one-story facilities. And again, um, I did a lot of work with the New York Clothing Bank. And the city gave them free space, um, but it was on the fourth floor of a uh, of a building, and everything that came in had to go in an elevator, which wouldn't be bad if it was only their elevator, but everybody in the whole building used it, and it was literally impossible to unload a truck um, and then to get it up to their wall. So again, it was one of those situations where free wasn't necessarily that great. So I always encourage people to use just um, one-story facilities. Um, Keep in mind that products should move in a straight line. Um, if, it, if the product's going in and are going out the same door, then it should be set up in a sort of somewhat of a circle. Um, ideally, even better is if there's product that goes in one door and out the other door. However it is, it doesn't matter as long as it moves in a straight line. Um, use efficient handle equipment, which we've already talked about. Having a storage plan. How do you determine when you unload a truck what goes where? That should be based on how it's going out. Um, minimize your aisle space. And by that I mean um, you the, the size of the aisles that you need. You want to make sure that, um, of course, they meet the legal requirements, but you don't need oversized aisles. Um, and again, I've already mentioned using the maximum height of the building. Any other thoughts on uh, layout and design? What a warehouse uh, looks like, I, how it, it operates. If I can chime in, this is Rick from Baby Buggy. We're uh, up on the eighth floor in an office building, and I have to tell you it is difficult at times. Um, we have to use a freight elevator to get our stuff up and out, so it, it is difficult. So a one-story facility would be great. And also the electric pallet jack, um, the one gentleman was talking about, we cannot use it because the freight elevator cannot handle the weight of it. So we use a manual pallet jack. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. So as you're preparing for the first shipment to come in, appointments are important. Uh, this is always a source of... Uh, of confusion, the truckers that are normally used to deliver products to charities are not used to delivering products to charities. They're used to just going somewhere and having a warehouse that's open all the time and able to accept their merchandise. So oftentimes they won't set up a, an appointment. They'll just show up. We tell all of our truckers that in order to come, because we don't have full-time uh, people at the warehouse, that they have to set up an appointment. So an appointment is very important. Make sure that you don't let a trucker bully you into uh, dropping off stuff if you're not ready for it. If they didn't call up and either the dispatch or the trucker himself calls you to set up an appointment. Um, if they do show up unannounced, um, you can turn them away and just tell them to come back when you have an appointment. They know that, just that it's not something that they're used to doing because normally they deliver to um, warehouses that are open all the time. Uh, volunteers, having the number of volunteers, the right volunteers, and instructed volunteers on what to do is always important at the appointed time. Um, accepting the delivery is an official, probably the only quote-unquote official act that happens in a warehouse is when the trucker unloads the truck, um, you're supposed to check it for um, let me back up when the truck is unloaded. You're supposed to check it for damage, check it and make sure that the um, that everything is the way it's supposed to be, um, that you get the amount and the quali quality and quantity that you were expecting. You sign off on that paper, you get a copy, the trucker gets a copy, and at that point the, the product becomes officially yours. You become responsible for it at that point. Great, did you um, at some point, at which um, time, if you, you find um, damage you haven't seen before, that you can refuse delivery? 
you can always refuse delivery until you sign that paper. Um, of course, if you unload a truck and at the last minute you are unhappy with it, you're going to have an unhappy trucker. But again, it's your responsibility to, before you sign that paper that you're sure you're getting what you're supposed to be getting. Now, sometimes, and that's a good question, that for us that's difficult because a lot of times we are unsure of the product that's coming from, in the case of the diapers, Kimberly Clark, they just said they're sending a truckload. And sometimes they said it'll all be of a certain size, and when it gets there, it's not that size. So although it doesn't match, still there's an expectation that it will be received because they are free diapers. And However, if the product is really damaged and uh, unused, at that point I would, unusable, at that point I would not accept the delivery. But oftentimes, especially in the case of diapers, if it's not exactly what we thought it would be, that's no reason not to accept it. That's normally just a phone call to to Allison or someone at the diaper bank letting them know of the difference between what they were expecting and what they received, as opposed to saying, we're not taking it, this stuff is junk, it's not at all what we wanted. So, Any, any more questions there? Anything else that we should... Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about here on the first shipment is know that it's not the proper responsibility to unload the truck. Sometimes they will. Sometimes you get a great guy or a great gal and they'll be willing to unload, but that's not their job. It's their job to get it to you safely, and they're going to go get a cup of coffee while you're unloading it. So um, if, if someone does help you unload it, you might want to give them a tip, and especially if you're in a bind and, uh, you know, you have volunteers that didn't show up and you're going to be really stuck if they don't help. They can help if they want, but it's a, at that point, it's a good idea to give them a tip. Their job is the truck driver. It's not the truck unloader. But I don't know if anyone else has any experience or stories about that, but that's always been my way to say this. So I want to take a, a, a minute also to talk about um, about accepting the goods and, and some of the things that um, we need to look at. You can go ahead and go to the, the next slide. But um, when that outside transportation, when just make sure that you know that when you sign that piece of paper, and you should sign that piece of paper, you should check the goods against the, the order that you originally received through email and, and the bill of lading. Make sure you check the quantities. And if there's something wrong, make sure you write it out at that point. Um, like I said, once you sign that paper, once the driver leaves, it's all on you. So you might want to make sure that you, you know, even have a report, a damage report, if you will. Um, and bills of lading. Sometimes if you're shipping stuff out, you might not have a bill of lading. You're not sure what to do. You can go online and find blank bills of lading that you can print out. You can find blank damage reports that you can print out and, and then fill out. But always make sure that you take a minute when you're receiving the goods um, and identifying them that you're getting what you expected. And if there's any discrepancy, that you write it down. And in the case of the National Diaper Bank Network, that you make sure Allison knows of any problems or discrepancies. Um, yes? So you're identifying the goods, they're coming off the truck. Normally it's good to have someone that's doing the counting and the examining while it's coming off the truck. So if you're the one doing the unloading or you know, you can have someone else kind of check it with every pallet that comes out, make sure that that process is, is thorough. Um, and once it's signed off and once it's yours, then at that point you have to decide where the goods are going to be dispatched, where they're going to be sorted. And put away, sometimes it's in that it's in that area, that staging area, where you decide this pallet is going to this area or that pallet's going to another area. You want to make sure that you um, take time to make sure that everything goes in the right place. And then from there, the goods are going to be held and kept in storage under proper protection until you're ready to distribute them. Sometimes the distribution might happen that same day. Sometimes the distribution might be weeks or months in the future. But again, talking about that flow that goes through is that after you've counted everything and checked everything and sent the driver on his way that you are now putting them where they're going to be in the best place for the flow for how they're going out. Again, the storage time is different for 
everybody for every different kind of product, but at some point you've got to pick the goods, and that requires knowing what's going out. And so that's sort of a transition in the, in the warehouse process is because um, there's different ways, different ways to select them of, you know, having one person going around selecting things um, or having the goods in different areas. Um, but, but however the goods are picked, then they get um, brought together where it's called after the goods are picked, the next step is called marshalling. That's um, taking all the different goods and making a single order that's going out. Again, the process of of checking it at the at the marshalling point of checking it um, to make sure that it's right that there's no errors or omissions and that the order records are updated. Maybe you might not have a, a certain item and you had to replace it with something else. So make sure you take that time. Again, the paperwork is important all the way through, but make sure that marshalling stage that after the goods are stored, after they're picked, and when they're marshaled, that you've got good paperwork to determine what's going out. And then the next step is when it goes out. I mean, that's called the dispatch. And they're packaged and um, they're shipped and they're prepared. They're ready to go. And then they get loaded in a car or they in a truck to go out. And then it's important, like I, I keep mentioning, to go back to those, those uh, records. So it's sort of a four-step process between the receiving, the storage, the shipping prep, and, and then the actual shipping going out. But when they're going out, you should have another bill of lading going out that um, – that corresponds to, you know, now you're on the other side. You want to know that once you put it in that person's car, you're not responsible. They can't come back anymore and say it wasn't right or there were some changes there. So this whole process of from the time the product comes in until it goes out is um, it's important to have good paperwork and good records the whole way, and it will serve you well if you um, so that you don't want to run into trouble once the product leaves your warehouse. Any questions or thoughts here? Hi, Chris. This is Sarah Schills from Westside Baby. Hi, Sarah. Um, I have a quick question going actually a full step back. <laughs> it might be embarrassing. We've been paying truckers with smiles and thank yous. What, what would be an average tip that you would offer a trucker that is, you know, generously helping you? Do you have a ballpark that you could tell us? Oh, that's a good question. I would imagine... Um, that's not how much they do, of course. I mean, a lot of times they'll jump in, especially if they know you're a charity, if they know that you're helping out. Most of the time, they're they're happy to do it. They don't even want anything. And and so I don't want you to think that, you know, you've been missing the boat all this time because a lot of times, even if you offer them twenty dollars or twenty five bucks, that okay. they, you know, that they wouldn't they wouldn't even take it then. And a lot of times they'll help you bring it from the back of the truck to the front of the truck. Um, yeah. But I I just but I just want to make sure that, that we're, we know that they're being generous, that it's not our expectations of them to unload the truck for us. Absolutely. That is very helpful. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, uh, anybody else have any other experience uh, with dealing with truckers that have helped them unload or, or what their experience has been with that? Yeah, so I think that's pretty much the same way that for everybody that Okay, good. Let's move on. A couple of things that uh, to talk about, um, just terms to know. They're kind of weird terms that aren't normally used, um, but are in warehouse space. So if you're talking about um, talking to people about warehouse space, they might use these terms, and you'll want to know what they are. One is uh, the apron space. The apron space is, as you can see in the picture, is the amount of room it takes to get a truck to turn around. To, to go in and, and pull back um, to the uh, to the docks or to the place where it's going to be unloaded. And like I mentioned earlier, in that one example of the warehouse that I had, the apron space was filled with parked cars, made it impossible to, to really work that warehouse. Um, so the apron space is very important. And uh, a, a good warehouse will have sufficient apron space. The second thing that we talk about a lot, which causes a lot of consternation on the NDB inside of the world, maybe not so much on your side, is that um, a lot of times if a, a diaper bank does not have a warehouse space or does not have the proper facilities, they'll request a lift gate. You can see the picture there of a lift gate on the back of the truck. There's a couple problems with um, using lift gates. One is they're, they're only used for local deliveries. They, 
very seldom, if ever, uh, travel interstate. And most of the donations that we send to the to the uh, to the to the diaper banks are from different states. So if you're requesting a lift gate, what happens is we have to pay for a truck to go into a dispatch facility in your local area, where it then gets unloaded, um, and then it go gets put on another truck, which has a lift gate, which you see here for a local delivery. And that is able to bring the pallets down to the to the floor level. It might sound easy, but it's not because it's a lot more expensive. Probably the single biggest cost that the National Diaper Bank Network has in shipping charges are with lift gates, with lift gate trucks. So a lot of times you'll see in the emails that I send out or in the in the conversations that we have, I, I need to know if you have a if you need a lift gate, we're trying to move away from using lift gates at all that you know we just can't afford to to pay all the extra costs associated with that, especially if it's just because uh, the people that are receiving the delivery have not taken the time just to look for adequate uh, warehouse space. And of course, that's one of the reasons that we're having this uh, webinar. But um, but it's, it's difficult because you can't put as much product in these trucks. They're much smaller. And um, and like I said, because it's handled so many more times, it becomes more expensive and um, the extra costs associated even with breaking down the pallets because sometimes we can't fit full pallets onto these uh, smaller trucks so they have to be broken down so there's a lot of extra effort and cost that go into using trucks um, and warehouses that require the trades. so in the past we've talked about it a lot but in the future you'll see us talking about it less and less just because we can't um, we can't effectively distribute the product the diapers that we need to um, to facilities that require lift gates any thoughts on either of these items? No? All right, so then we'll move on to the next one. I think we're winding down. Um, so uh, maybe this is a messed up one. There's supposed to be two different ones here. So the yeah. pallet you hear us talk, I think it, Somehow that's not right. That's not the way it works. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, let's just talk about the pallets. A lot of people ask what a pallet is when they're first getting involved. I'm sure it's warehousing 101 if you use pallets before. But a pallet is uh, four foot wide by four foot long. They're made out of wood. Um, pallets that come from overseas containers are different than a lot of wood in overseas containers. And normally here in the States, these are the standard pallets four by four. And they can be stacked. A lot of times you'll want to know if they're double stacked or not. And you hear us talking about that. And basically, that's where the amount of product on one pallet is flat across the top and able to withstand the weight of a second pallet. So technically, if 26 pallets fit on the floor of a 53-foot truck, if it's double stacked, then you'll end up with 52 pallets. So that's what double stacked means. And that was what was supposed to be at the bottom. So sorry if I messed that up. But that's a pallet, 26 fit on a 53-foot truck. And double stacked means that just that, that twice as many pallets fit on the same floor space. And then I think the last slide. So, any questions, any thoughts? Did I miss anything? Is there a certain height that the loading dock needs to be? Um. Well, again, it's all about ease of use, right? So if it's at least as high as any truck coming in, then you're not going to have any trouble. If it's shorter than a truck coming in, then if tall pallets, I don't know, I think sometimes the diapers come pretty tall. If tall pallets come off a truck, you might have to stop before you unload the truck and peel off a couple layers of cartons off the top of the pallet just to get it through the door of the loading valve. So certainly you can use a loading dock with a lower door, but in the perfect warehouse is one that doesn't require all that extra work. I How high is the average, uh, average trailer, um, Chris? Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, I don't know. Emilio, do you know? Uh, it just depends. Uh, I think it's around 14, 16 feet. Uh, I would say 14, 16 you know. too. But, but from the bot from the bottom of um, mm -hmm. from the bottom up because it's a uh, standard it's uh it's four feet from the concrete up mm -hmm. uh, so it'd be around you know you know uh, 
you're looking 48 at inches. It, yeah, around 48 inches. So you're looking at 18 to 20 feet high total. Uh, but you, you would also, need the, the loading dock to be about four feet or so. High, yeah. And it's all going to depend too, because sometimes you're going to have um, they're going to be flat when they're driving in. Uh, sometimes your loading docks will go down, at, you know, at an angle. Um, and then it also is going to depend on the uh, the tire pressure in the truck and the weight in the in the cab. And sometimes it'll drop the uh, the truck itself. That's why it's really good for everybody to have like a lift plate, uh, a plate to connect the uh, the truck to the the loading dock. They're pretty cheap. You can go to Uline, um, and you can buy them. They're like a hundred and 180 bucks for just a regular pallet jack one that'll stand, uh, you know, 5,000 pounds or so. Um, and the, the more you know, the more weight you get for it that it can stand, the more it'll expensive it'll be. But those plates are great because it'll it'll bridge any gap in between, and it'll also um, allow you if the truck's sitting too low, allow it to uh, ramp up into the into the loading dock. So, Emilio, that was a, a lift plate. Yeah, it's a, they're called lift plates. Yeah, it's basically just a, a very strong but flat piece of metal yeah. you know, that can be laid in between the gap. Great. Great. Good, good stuff, good questions, good input. Anything else? Um, yeah, hi, Chris. This is Lisa from Help a Mother Out. I had a question about double stack pallets, um, specifically coming from NDBN. Do you know whether or not we would have insight before the delivery, whether or not the pallet would be double stacked, or is it just a general sort of, should we assume that they would be double stacked? Emilio, you've gotten the most <laughs> truckloads from them. Uh, and yeah. It's all been a, it's been a hodgepodge, right? Really. Yeah, it's pretty much a hodgepodge. It comes, uh, some of them will come fully you know, up to a, the 16 feet stacked high, and, uh, you know, they, they will be completely to the top, and then sometimes you'll get them that they'll be triple stacked, and it'll just be one, it, it'll be one on top of another on top of another up to the top. Um, it was a remark that we had, uh, my, my uh, volunteers and I had was the first shipment that came in, was Huggy doesn't play around, Kimberly Clark doesn't play around when they put those diapers in there. <laughs> that they um, they find every little last inch, and if they can squeeze double stacks onto them, or even up to triple stacks, they will. Um, they will use every bit of that truck that they can. Uh, so it is, it's a, it's a hodgepodge, it's a mismatch of, of pallets. You really aren't going to know until you get it, and sometimes you're even going to get bins. You'll get bins that just have a, uh, Different sizes into them, that just they have it. It, it really it, it'll be a mixture. And on your your bills of lady, they'll say mixture. Um, they'll say a, uh, they'll say mixture of diapers. <laughs> but you, you you really don't know. It, it, it's it's until you open up the truck. And yeah, and even on the opposite extreme, we've gotten trucks that have had pallets that only have like one. One carton of diapers on a whole entire pallet, just one little tiny lonely box sitting there. So I think as they're cleaning out their warehouses, if they've got a lot of stuff, they're going to stack it tight and deep, like Amelia was talking about. But if it's just whatever, if they're just cleaning out a warehouse of, of diapers that didn't sell, and there's just one box sitting on the pallet, they'll throw that pallet on there and get a truck uh, that that looks like that. So I mean, if I think I want to say it runs a whole entire gamut of you don't know. But, Emilio, I did want to stop there. The bill of lading is always correct, right? Uh, yes. Every every shipment that we've gotten in, every bill of lading has been correct. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I think would be useful, Chris, is if um, – I, I, I'm sorry, I was I was commuting on the on the boat, so I'm sorry if, if you guys showed a, a, a sample bill of lading, but is there – is it would it be possible to, to maybe show the attendees you know, maybe a follow-up, like, just, like, um, to have sort of sort of a guide to what, you know, because, I mean, I'm familiar with the bill of lading, but it, it's always very confusing to me of, like, what I should be looking for. Sort of maybe a key. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, we could put um, together an NTA bill of lading, I think. Um, Emilio, well, Chris, uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, are they the same, uh, you, really? Are they the same? Them. I've never seen two bills of lading that were the same. Uh, they're not. Uh, all of them come different. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe then a yeah, couple of, of uh, examples where we could highlight, circle and highlight and say what this, you know, this is where it's from. This is where the, uh, the we find the sizes. Yeah, I think that'd be really helpful because what we've had in the past is when we have the bill of lading, you know, we've sort of looked at it and, you know, maybe it has, um, you know, was mentioned that there's, you know, it's always a hodgepodge and sometimes pallets, they're not, you know, there may be a mixture of um, inventory on, on one pallet and that different, there's different pallets that have different inventory. Um, so it would be helpful to know, I don't know, even if it, they don't all look alike, but maybe just to, if there was sort of a boilerplate one. Um, with the, what you said, Allison, is, you know, highlight the what, we'll see what we can do for you, Lisa, and we'll send it, send it out to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll make sure that happens. Good. What else? Any other questions? A couple minutes left. Well, this has been fun. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for this. This has been this is super um, informative, and I know that a lot of people who couldn't make it today wanted to um, to see the posted and, uh, recording. So we'll put that up as soon as we can. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great day, and um, I hope that uh, the snow has ended for you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.